Hello, everybody. If I could have your attention, please. Welcome and thank you so much for coming to Potentiel. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event that is designed to help you meet some of the most inspiring role models in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math today, as well as um, mingle, collaborate with many like-minded individuals and just get a better understanding of what it means um, to be working in STEM today. My name is Divya, I'm the high school president and I'm also very happy to be your host for this evening. Note that this is a bilingual event, so some parts of it will take place in English and other parts in French. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, et merci et bienvenue d'être um, bienvenue à notre événement potentiel en sciences. Um, je vous remercie d'être venu et um, à cet événement qui est l'occasion de, de se rencontrer avec um, des modèles dans les domaines scientifiques aujourd'hui. Je m'appelle Divia et j'ai le plaisir um, de vous introduire à cet événement. Um, et uh, oui, j'espère que c'est um, c'est une expérience très agréable pour tout le monde. Tout le monde. Donc, um, I'd just like you to think about these three words. Innovation, progress, prosperity. How can these be realized when half the world's population is underrepresented in most of the important fields? Whether it be research, invention, or industry, we need the voices of women and girls to shine through to solve some of society's most pressing problems. A significant gender gap has persisted throughout the years at all levels of science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, subjects all over the world. Even though women have made tremendous progress towards increasing their participation in higher education, they are still underrepresented in these fields. For example, in cutting edge fields such as artificial intelligence, today only one in five professionals is a woman. And that is the reason why we highlight the International Day of Women and Girls in Science annually in February. Today at Potentiel, we have the honor to celebrate a panel of wonderful innovators and role models in STEM at the International School of Lausanne. Of course, we're delighted to host this bilingual event in collaboration with the HBA, Inspiring Girls Switzerland, and Model. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Merck and Frontiers, for transforming this idea into a reality. Um, now, without further ado, I have um, the pleasure of um, handing over the word to our representatives from the HBA, from Model and Inspiring Girls Switzerland, to give you an idea of who they are and what their missions are. So, a huge round of applause, please. Bonsoir à tous et bienvenue à Potentiel en Sciences. Je vais me présenter. Je suis Isabelle Jean-Goudou, je suis présidente de l'association HBA Suisse Romande, qui est une association qui est très connue dans le monde, dans le milieu de la santé. Alors, comme c'est un événement en deux langues, je vais présenter en français, mes slides sont en anglais. Je peux peut-être switcher de temps en temps la langue. Je tenais déjà à vous remercier d'être ici présent ce soir. Pour la petite histoire, c'est la troisième année que nous organisons Potentiel en sciences. Les deux premières années, HBA Suisse Romande les a organisées en ligne parce que c'était pendant le Covid. Et c'est vraiment un énorme plaisir pour moi de voir une salle remplie avec des personnes que nous pourrons regarder face à face, alors que les deux dernières années, c'était en ligne. Alors, comme je vous ai dit, je suis présidente de l'association HBA Suisse Romande, mais j'ai aussi un job. Je suis Global Marketing Manager Acute Care dans une entreprise qui s'appelle Beckton Dickinson. Et je travaille, bien entendu, dans le monde de la santé. Alors, qu'est-ce que HBA Donc, HBA est une association qui a été créée en 1977. C'est une association très représentative qui comporte des personnes qui sont orientées dans la santé et des femmes qui ont vraiment envie de travailler sur leur carrière. Ce que nous voulons, c'est avoir plus de femmes représentatives dans les conseils d'administration de ces grandes sociétés, dans le milieu de la pharmacie, des produits médicaux, que ce soit biotech et medtech. Une chose très importante, c'est que nous voulons aussi la parité. Ça veut dire que, bien évidemment, il faut des représentations féminines, mais aussi des représentations masculines. Et le plus important, c'est que nous travaillons de manière non lucrative. Nous sommes une association. Nous faisons aussi tout ce qu'il faut pour avoir les bons networks, les bons réseaux pour aider les femmes. À part d'aider les femmes, nous avons aussi la possibilité d'avoir des affinity groups 
où nous représentons les personnes qui travaillent dans la science, notamment les Women in STEM. Où nous sommes situés Nous sommes situés surtout aux États-Unis, mais aussi en Europe. Nous avons des chapters aux États-Unis et en Europe, nous avons un énorme chapter qui devient même le chapter IMIA. Il faut savoir que dans chaque pays que vous voyez ici, il y a un représentant en chapter de HBA. Par contre, en Suisse, on a énormément de chance. Il y a trois chapters. Un en Suisse romande, un à Zurich-Zouk et puis un aussi à Bâle. Et pourquoi Parce que nous avons la chance d'avoir énormément d'entreprises dans le milieu de la pharma, des produits médicaux, Bedtech et Biotech. Donc c'est la raison pour laquelle il y a trois chapters en Suisse. Autre chose très importante, rien qu'en Europe, nous avons 1500 membres et nous avons également 300 volontaires, notamment moi, il y a aussi des volontaires de Juillet Suisse Romande ce soir. Et ces 13 chapitres travaillent en coordination. En ce qui concerne la Suisse, nous aussi, nous organisons des événements à travers la Suisse et avec la coordination du chapter de Bâle et du chapter de zurich -Souk. Alors, je vais un peu vous parler de deux sponsors, des corporate partners. Évidemment, comme nous travaillons dans le monde de la santé, nous collaborons avec énormément d'entreprises de, dans la santé. Puis, on a une ce soir que je voulais particulièrement remercier qui s'appelle Merck. Et il y a des représentants de Merck ce soir. Je vous remercie beaucoup de nous supporter. C'est la troisième année. Donc, c'est vraiment un immense plaisir de vous avoir ici dans la salle. Et également Frontières, je voulais également vous remercier. C'est un immense plaisir de vous avoir. Il faut savoir que nos partenaires sont très intéressants parce que grâce à eux, on a beaucoup plus de volontaires. Et aussi, ça participe à la renommée de l'entreprise et aussi de l'association. Et maintenant, qu'est-ce que nous offrons dans cette association Il faut savoir que nous offrons des opportunités de networking, des opportunités de, de faire du volontariat, d'avoir des opportunités de leadership. C'est-à-dire quand vous êtes volontaire, vous pouvez développer des compétences de leadership peut-être que vous n'avez pas dans le cadre de vos sociétés. Donc, en tout, et aussi un mentoring programme. Et 87%, on va dire 87% de ces activités sont les activités les plus préférées de nos membres. Il faut aussi savoir que la majorité des personnes qui sont volontaires dans notre association reconnaissent que grâce à cette association, elles ont eu la possibilité de booster leur, leur carrière. Moi-même, je peux le dire, grâce à cette association, j'ai pu booster ma carrière. Now I'm going to speak in English because this slide is in French. Um, I just wanted to give some essential points what it's really important for us at HPA. Community is very important for us because we like to share and we like also to learn. Networking, as I said, is very important. Like tonight, I really would like to take the opportunity to network and to meet new people. Education, this event, actually, it's a both a networking event and a an education event because we have the great opportunity with the kids to learn more about STEMs and also to be inspired by them. Development of leadership by experience. Like I said, when you are in an association like that, you have the opportunity to develop skills and even opportunities of public speaking that you will not have in the context of your company. Mentoring. We have an awesome mentoring program, a nine-month program, and if you think about what What's being given to you in the ninth month, you don't find that in the rest of the industry. Visibility, again, when you are volunteering and when you work in this association, you have the great pleasure to meet nice people like you guys. And also, I really want to say that we also recognize the people that are supporting us um, by giving them awards. Myself, I got two awards thanks to the association. And then, The last slide is about my awesome team, HBS Fus Roman. Some of them are here tonight. Ladies, can you just? Yeah, so there's Minji for programming. Hey, Minji. There's also Julie Ning for programming. Hey. And there's also Annette. Are, are you there, Annette? Annette from Markham and me, the president. So, Not further ado, I just wanted to thank my team because thanks to them for the third year, we have this awesome opportunity to see you. Um, I would like also to thank all our sponsors. So thank you so much, Merck Frontier, and also thank you ESL Model Inspiring Girls, and thank you all for being there. 
And I would like you to have a round of applause for yourself because you're so great for being there tonight. Thank you so much. I'm going to use this. It's easier for me. Do you, everyone hears me? Is it English better or French? You go English? <laughs> so I was told English, so let's stick with English. So, well, I'm Andrea Delanois, and I'm so happy to be here tonight because I still remember when I was your age, so, which means high school. It's a long time ago, 35 to 40 years, but I still remember, and what I remember mostly is that I love chemistry. I loved chemistry. I was very good at it. But I had a male teacher who told me when we, th there was this national contest and I wanted to participate. And he said to me, well, I think the boys have better chances. We really want this award. And I was like, okay. But I was stubborn already at the time. And I insisted, I begged him to uh, let me train with the boys and uh, get the trials. And I said, if I, I don't, I miss the pre-tests, uh, then, well, I'm going to just accept it. But just let me do. So he accepted it. I trained with the boys. There were three boys in me. And believe it or not, I passed the past dress, and I went to the, the, the it's Olympics, uh, it's called uh, back in Romania. And I got the second prize. And believe it or not, the first prize was a girl as well. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, my, I became the shoo-shoo of my teacher after that, obviously. But something stayed with me, though. It was unconscious, but I did start to say, well, maybe it's not for me, chemistry. Science is not for me. Then it was my dad who said, with your expensive taste for fashion, it's not going to uh, lead you far. So I studied finance. Well, I didn't study the uh, sciences, the, 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 let's say regular ones, but I remain in my heart a scientist. Everything I do is empirical, and I, am, I do think in scientific terms. I do not regret st uh, studying finance and, and uh, politics, but I love and, and ever since I am very close to the scientific world. And when I moved to Switzerland in 20, uh, 2003, and I realized how, many, how few, actually, girls choose uh, scientific careers, STEM careers, I was like, God, I have to do something about it. And I, uh, I co-founded an, asso an association in Geneva uh, called Expanding Your Horizons, precisely to promote sciences among the girls, because I didn't want other girls to be told, let's leave, leave the place with the boys. And then in 2018, I created Model, uh, founding Model, which works uh, with, private, uh, with uh, primary schools to talk to children, we bring professional women, amazing professional women of all walks of life to, into schools to talk to uh, the children, the young people, about jobs, their jobs, about their careers, and to um, just give them this sense of do what you feel here. As the American, uh, American um, um, uh, child protection uh, activist, Marian Wright Edelman put it, you can't be what you can't see. So we're hoping with Medell to show to the kids what they could be should they choose to. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Ruth, and I'm here to present you Inspiring Girls. Uh, I am the country chair and the president of Inspiring Girls Switzerland. Inspiring Girls is an association that is dedicated to raising the aspirations of young girls around the world. We are present in 28 countries, and uh, what we do with each of these country chapters is to have a local lens on top of our global presence. So we can do uh, this kind of events, focus on the, um, the specific countries that we work in. Our aim is to raise the aspiration of young girls, as I said, by connecting them with female role models from all different careers and backgrounds so they can feel uh, the possibilities that are at their hand. Um, as you see in these uh, brief statistics I played for you, um, girls feel that they cannot go into STEM fields, they don't feel that they have the same possibilities as men, and they don't feel that they can be leaders. This is something that we try to tackle by addressing these labels that are placed on some careers, by addressing 
this low self-esteem of girls from age eight to going into these professions by giving them references, showing them with women that are doing exactly what they could do, that it is possible because if she can see it, she can be it. So the format for this evening is that we're now going to hear from our plenary speakers and then we're going to break into age appropriate workshops. So Model will be leading the group for eight to 12 year years old on what's my job. Um, meanwhile, we'll stay here in the um, auditorium for a session on un unconscious bias with Dr. Eglantine Jamie and myself, Katrina Edmonds. We'll then be going um, simultaneously, the 16 to 18 year olds will be doing a session on STEM leaders organised by the, by the HBA and the 13 to 15 year olds will be doing a day in the life with inspiring girls. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Stefania to tell us all about why we're marking this day. I think I'll take the... Thank you so much. Can you hear me? It's so great to be here and it's so great to see so many people, so many girls. There's some boys as well, right? Where are the boys? So nice to see you as well, and so many parents gathered here today for such an important topic. I'm going to dive right into it, um, because I have my daughter here, Elisa, and her friend Olivia, and I practiced my presentation with them before, and they told me to not be boring and go <laughs> straight to the point. So I'm going to try and do just that. So I work at the United Nations, and as you know, um, we're celebrating the day that the UN marked as the day for, day for science and girls. Have you guys heard of the United Nations? Yeah, right? Well, in the United Nations, we work on a lot of different topics. A lot of complex topics, global challenges. These are our goals. And you can see, you know, it includes ensuring that no one's poor around the world, ensuring that everybody has enough food on the table, ensure that everybody's in good health, that they're the same opportunities for boys and girls, and while in total we have 17 goals. And I think you'd agree with me that these are pretty complex challenges that we need to find solutions to. And so when we're working on them, we're gonna need a lot of different people. We need to tap into a lot of different talent, a lot of different knowledge, a lot of different experience, and a lot of different points of view, a lot of ideas. And obviously this includes your ideas and the ideas of women and girls, because as we mentioned before, we are 50% of the population after all. It's also gonna involve a lot of different professions and a lot of different types of jobs, right? And that includes jobs in STEM, so in science and tech and engineering and in math, like the women you're gonna hear from today. And why do we need science to solve these global goals? Well, in order to solve these goals, we really need to understand the problems. And science, data, it gives us analysis, it makes us better understand our world and better understand these problems, and that way we can find better solutions for them. And why are we focusing on girls? We need everybody, right? Well, oops. We definitely need everybody, but the fact is that today, unfortunately, even though we're making great progress, there's still less girls choosing science careers, or kind of choosing, like Andrea, but then for one reason or another, finding another way. Or coming, going into jobs in science, but then changing. So that's a fact. And so we want science to, of course, have lots of boys and all different types of boys from many different backgrounds. And we want it to have a lot of girls. What we want is actually that science is representative and as diverse as the world that we live in. The fact is, as I said, that we still have not enough girls in science. And this actually impacts our everyday lives in ways that you may not even really be aware of. Let's see. I don't know if you've heard of these examples before. They're not mine. They come from a fascinating book that I'm obsessed with that's called Invisible Women, and I'm happy to give you the reference after. 
But some of you, we came from Geneva, and we came by car. I don't know if anybody else came by car. Well, if you're a woman, and you're sitting in the car seats, and you put your seatbelt on, in the case, in the unfortunate event that you have a car accident, if you're a woman, you're actually 17% more likely to die from the car accident, and 47% more likely to be seriously injured from a car accident, because you're a woman. And this is the reason why, because we're still using crash dummies. So you know when they do those safety tests with the cars? They use crash dummies that are the height and weight of the average man. And of course, men and women are not the same, right? The average height and weight of a woman is not the same as that of a man. So what does that mean? That means at the time that they were designing or creating these crash dummies, there were probably not that many women. And still today, that probably means that those people that are deciding on the regulations and the laws that should require us what type of crash dummies to use, there's probably not enough women um, there either. Okay. For the sake of time, I'm going to... So maybe you've heard this example as well. What do we think about when we think about a heart attack? So this was me trying to Google heart attack in French. And... Um, you know, when you look at movies and someone has a heart attack, what is the first thing that they do? They hold their hands up to their heart and, they, oh, and they're out of breath. So these are the typical symptoms that we associate with a heart attack, right? Did you know that those are actually the typical symptoms for a man? So women actually have, tend to have different or can have different symptoms. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, and these are some of them. So women can have slightly different, also feel a bit anxious, have their backs hurt. And so what does this mean? Again, well, when you have a heart attack and you're a woman, you may misdiagnose yourself. And actually in Canton de Vaud, so I just read a study on from 2021, so where we are now in Canton de Vaud, if you have a symptoms of a heart attack and you go to the doctor, uh, men are two to three times more likely to be sent to a specialist, and women are more likely to be sent back home and be told that they're having an anxiety attack. And this is only because there's not enough women in the field to detect, and we're not testing on enough women. So again, we need girls. Um, the world needs science. We need science to figure out all of these global problems. And science needs women and girls. And the reason why there's not enough women and girls in science is very complex. And it's not as simple as just, oh, girls don't like science. Because I know you do. And you like technology, and you like engineering, and you like math. And so I really think today's event, and thank you so much for the International School of Lausanne for inviting me, is so important to hear from role models that are doing it and that are working in different types of jobs. And I'm going to finish with one example about the importance of role models. My sister works at a school similar to this one in Geneva, and she's a replacement teacher in primary school. And she noticed that for a couple of years, I mean, we know science is not the only field where there's not enough girls. There's also other areas. And football seemed to be an area in the school where they didn't have enough girls. You need seven girls to form a team, a football team. And for a couple of years, they were not getting enough girls, um, the seven minimum required girls to create a football team. And so my sister, who's always played football, said, can I try something? And they said, yes, go ahead. And she created these flyers, and she went to every single classroom in the primary school building and said, hey, I'm organizing this fun football activities for girls. Um, boys are also in invited, but this is really targeted for girls, and we're going to do something super fun. I'm going to organize it. Um, come, you know, come at lunchtime. You don't need to sign up. Just show up if you feel like it. Bring your friends. They gave her about seven footballs, and she didn't expect that many people to come. So she goes to lunchtime, and there were over 40 girls that came. And she played with them, she talked with them, and she said, well, afterwards, sign up. And the next year, so this was at the beginning of the summer, in September, they had so many girls sign up that not only did they hire my sister as a coach, but they needed to hire an assistant coach. And one of the main reasons, besides her enthusiasm, that she made it really fun and she targeted girls specifically, is that they had never had a female coach before, right? And so just the fact of seeing someone else doing it and seeing other girls do it, it's a positive, virtuous cycle. Um, 
So thank you so much. I'm so excited to hear about the other uh, role models and what they're doing in their jobs. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or want to chat um, or are curious about the UN. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Stefania. Um, I, I'm already just itching with excitement for the session where I'll be delving into uh, unconscious bias with Dr. Jemmy. But first, we have Dr. Arshana Sharma um, here from CERN. Hello, everybody. So I come back again to the sustained development goals that uh, Stefania just mentioned, because it's extremely important. Now, uh, you also see a little girl in that corner there who's been with me for literally 10 years now, every time I make a small presentation, simply because I would like all the girls to imagine that they have to be curious, they have to ask questions, they have to bother their teachers, they have to bother their parents, bother every person they meet who can ask, answer their questions. Will you do that? Yes. yes. So I will ask you a question. Where did we come from? Mom. <laughs> Mom, absolutely correct. Mom, but then where did mom come from? Keep going, keep going, keep going. And so you have to keep going up to the point where you say, where did the universe come from, right? And that's the question we are answering or trying to answer at CERN. Excusez-moi, ma français c'est très mal. J'arrive pas exprimer, mais les questions j'ai pas. Okay. So uh, in, the, in, in this simply asking questions, you have so many opportunities for girls, for boys, for uh, you to not only study, but to make a difference to the whole planet. Right? Now, if you, look at, if you look at the names that you think of when you think of scientists, right? Everybody says, oh, Newton saw the apple, and that's why we understand gravity. I think all of you know that, right? Sim Correct, and then who's the other one? Uh oh, you need to know that. <laughs> All right, but then you see your, the world around you every single day when you're using your mobile phone, when you're watching the television, when you're looking, doing your homework using Google. All that is coming from science and the science that we, um, that we, that we all know and we study, and you will study if you haven't studied. But the point is that you do not know uh, how many people recognize any of these women scientists. Anybody? At least one, come on. At least one. <laughs> yes, yes. Very good, bravo. You have to give me your name. <laughs> Olivia. Olivia knows Mary Curie. Now this is very s sad, isn't it? that all of us should know Marie Curie as much as we know about Einstein or Newton. So that's the catch where we need to make a difference. But the problem is that we are always looking only at the, uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg. We do not know, we do not know, that's the problem. We do not know where to proceed. And that was exactly the situation when I studied, started studying in college, which means that Everything was confused, unclear, didn't know which direction to go. So another way to do, uh, to spell nuclear physics is unclear physics, <laughs> right? So my parents thought uh, that my daughter is going to study physics simply because looking at blood, I used to start crying. So no biology for me. Physics was all right. That's my school up there. You can see this is in India, in Jhansi, a small place, which you may not have heard about, of course. But then I had fantastic teachers. So the teachers here are really the people who are responsible for igniting the spark of science in the children. And I really um, uh, appeal to them to go that extra mile because a little nudge can change the life of a student like my, like my science teacher did 
and we heard about another teacher recently as well. So teachers make a, a, such an impact which is multifold, it's exponential. You know, you make a nudge here. When I was uh, 13 years old, and look, today I can say that I can speak to you all about science simply because my teacher helped me and nurtured me to go in the right direction. So I was like a great student in India, but when I came to Geneva for the first time, you know, I came like, oh, wow, I'm a gold medal student. But then at CERN, you may have heard, how many people have heard about CERN? C-E-R-N in Geneva. What, does, what do we do there? Anybody knows? Uh, amazing, 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 amazing. That's what we do. But you know what? I didn't know anything how to do. Uh, I had learned about nuclear physics in India, but I came here and I, somebody said collider here and I'm very impressed. So I had to work with the collider kind of experiments and good Lord, I had to study again. So I went back to university in Geneva. I studied and studied and studied, but eventually you see, I made a difference. I got patents, I worked on technologies, and in the end, you know, I mean, I am now actually leading at least three very big projects across 40 countries and many, many, many institutions. And I have more than 300 people who work with me and we are making a big difference. And you see here, these are the kind of detectors we are doing, right? All right. So now you will say that you are doing it as a physicist. You're curious, all right, but then what? Why should I care about it? You should care about it because what happened a couple of years ago? What hit us from the blue? COVID, right? Did we know anything about COVID before that? No. no. Now how the hell can we find a solution if we do not know how to look at the virus? So we needed microscopes. And for specialized microscopes, we needed to have, huh? Sorry? <laughs> to study, yes. First, we have to study the COVID virus, and then we will be able to find a solution, correct? So to look at the virus, we needed microscopes, specialized microscopes, which are based on quantum physics. And these co that's why we study physics. So people would imagine, oh, why did I study quantum physics? That's so boring. But we had to study it because only then we were able to understand what is a COVID virus, right? I, that uh, slide is missed, so don't worry. I just want to ask another question that uh, sometimes we break a bone, right? How many of you, are, of you have broken a bone ever? Some of you have, right? So two times, oh la la. All right, so you went to the hospital. You went to the hospital and you said, my bone is broken. What did the doctor say? I need to do an? X-ray. Where did that come from? Very good, so you know the answer. So who will study science? How many of you will study science? The little kids. Everybody will study science and very soon the International School of Lausanne will have the most graduated um, doctors, physicists, <laughs> chemists coming from the school. Yeah, let's keep going. So just to say that the young people, uh, it's extremely important that they engage because it's only then that they, they'll be able to solve problems of the world, isn't it? Not only here in my school or in my, in my uh, Vodua region, but the whole large scale issues, as was already said, for sustained development goals. So now here is a book that is written by two students with me because they were supposed to come to CERN in 2020. And they couldn't come because COVID hit us all. And these little kids said, but you know what, we still want to do something with you. And I scratched my head and I said, come on now, what can I do? And you know, COVID going on, it was really difficult. So fortunately, we have the World Wide Web. And you, do you know, how many of you know where did it come from, the World Wide Web? <laughs> come on! Yes, Lucerne, okay? It's coming from CERN. 
So anyways, because of the web, we could sit on meetings, like online meetings, and these two kids helped write this book with me. It's called The A to Z of Sun. And I think there's somebody in the audience with whom I am planning to write a book on the same matter, but for little kids. And I want two little girls to come and help me. All right? So you have to then um, just get in touch. And there's lots to do. And I hope that you all make a huge difference, huge impact to the sustained development goals of the world. And OK, that's the book. Uh, it's already shown. And uh, anyway, that's where we are, baby <laughs> girls. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, say that a bit for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I've got lots of copies of this book. If anyone's interested, please get in touch with her. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so if you're in the ISL community, come and see Miss Edmonds uh, to get your copy of the book. Um, you can also approach us through this evening. So next up, we have a medical doctor by training, but I'm very interested to hear what happened next because I met uh, Dr. Suvina Sahi through my husband um, when he was working at the In Impact Hub, which is an innovator space for new businesses. Come on up and tell us more. All right, hello everyone. Who here has heard of entrepreneurship or being an entrepreneur? Raise your hand. Most people, when they've heard of this term, they think of Steve Jobs, they think of Elon Musk. Can you think of any women, female entrepreneurs that you've met? So when I was in middle school, high school, I also hadn't really heard of the term entrepreneurship and I definitely had, didn't know of any women that was doing it. So I actually went to the International School of Geneva I, just down the road, I think it's a rival school to ISL. <laughs> uh, I graduated in 2010, and when I was at the International School of Geneva, I always knew that I loved science. I loved science because actually I had a super inspirational teacher that made me love and appreciate the sciences so much. But when you look at the path to becoming an entrepreneur, everything starts, which is exactly where you are now, and that's school. So as we said, the spark of a teacher. But when you're thinking about your careers, you always think about classical jobs. At least I did. I thought, oh, do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be a biochemist? Do I want to be a lawyer? Do I want to be an engineer? But what you don't realize is how many jobs there are out there that are related to science that you will just have never, ever heard of. And that's the beauty of it. I think a lot of you now will be, uh, well, the year 13s amongst you will be thinking about applying to university or will have just applied to university. And normally when you think about what to apply for university, you think, okay, if I like chemistry, maybe I'll study chemistry. If I like math, maybe I'll study math. Or you think like I did. I want to be a doctor, so I'll study medicine. So that's precisely where I did. And that's where it all starts, where the passion and the spark ignites. What I would say is that you get to uni, like I did, you spend six years at medical school, like I did, and you realize, oh man, it's not really what I wanted to do. <laughs> but it's a bit late to go back and turn back time. So you think to yourself, okay, let me keep going and let me really pursue what I'm interested in. So at medical school, I really developed a strong interest in women's health, in sexual health, um, and I thought, okay, maybe the best way to do this is to be a gynecologist. But by symptom of growing up in this area near the WHO, I was always super interested in public health. So I thought, okay, why not do an extra degree in public health and see where that takes me? And I think that no matter what you do, um, it's always so important to pursue what you're interested in. Within science, there's so many uh, subfields within that. Just explore, speak to people, approach the people around you, speak to your parents' friends, your friends' parents, um, and really get an idea of what there is out there. Because a lot of it also comes down to luck. So, as I said, I was super interested in public health, and when I did this degree in public health, I really had the luck of meeting an incredible professor. 
this professor um, had been commissioned by the WHO to review all of the tests that were out there to detect uh, sexually transmitted infections in pregnant women. So why is this important? It's important because the WHO realized that women all around the world were actually positive for sexually transmitted infections without knowing. And they were only finding out when it was too late. So too late because um, we were getting complications during birth, babies were too small, babies were coming too early, babies were born blind. So again, a huge area that we knew nothing about. And so we were tasked with trying to find a test that was quick, that was accurate, um, and that was really, really cheap so that no matter where in the world you were, you could do it and get a result very quickly. So the next thing that really comes down to is just going for it. So after spending about four years researching with this professor, I said to myself, okay, do you know what? I've had the chance now to discover that there's this big problem, there's this big gap, we don't have a test, so what can we do about it? And it was then that we started looking and analyzing different technologies that were available. How can we really achieve this? It took us years to look at all the available technologies and then we finally found one right here on the doorstep at the University of Geneva one that allowed us to detect DNA in a very low cost way and allowed us to see DNA with an ink. Sounds so great and it was so groundbreaking, we had to learn more. So we tested it in a lab and it worked. So there I was, <laughs> I've spent at this point 10 years working for the NHS in the UK, studying to be a doctor, wanting to be a doctor, and then all of a sudden this huge opportunity presents itself. So what do you do? Do you leave your stable job behind and go into a world where you will not be taking a salary, you have no idea what's about to come with loads of high risk? So I think if you wanna pursue a passion or a journey in entrepreneurship, you probably have to be a little bit dumb as well, but uh, that's what I was. And so um, I decided to go for it. And the beauty about being in Switzerland, and I think that was presented earlier um, when we were learning about the HBA, is that we have such an amazingly high concentration of med tech, biotech, science here. And the Swiss government is no different. You know, the Swiss government invests so much money and gives out so much money to entrepreneurs, to researchers, to scientists who've developed great technologies and want to turn them into businesses and to startups. So you're really in the melting pot and the hub of it all right here. But finally, I think if I were to look at the stages to becoming an entrepreneur, the thing that you need the most is grit. We talked a little bit about the unconscious bias that comes with, uh, with being a, a woman. So for example, when we conduct clinical trials uh, to test drugs in, in different populations, we normally exclude women. And so a lot of the time when we're prescribing drugs, we've got no idea how this will work in women as it does to a man. And then now when I go out and I speak to people to pitch to them my business idea to try and raise funding, 1.2% of all of the money in the world that's available goes to female founders. So again, a huge gap. And so I think the, the image that I had here didn't load, but you're gonna go through a journey where lots of people will say, will say no to you, but all you have to do is just think yes <laughs> and keep going and you'll get there. So thank you very much for inviting me to talk and I'm happy to talk to you later. Thank you. So our penultimate speaker is also joining us from a nearby institution. Um, Professor Marina Vyazowska um, works at the EPFL. And I know I have many excited colleagues uh, and students here this evening to welcome a Fields Medal winner in mathematics to the stage. So thank you very much. It is an exciting opportunity to be here and to see so many girls and so many uh, parents of the uh, girls who are interested in science and who think that science is uh, a great career, I think, for, for everyone. And we already heard how important science is and, but also, and also how rewarding it is because I think that the, uh, the only true magic that exists in this life is science. <laughs> and... Uh, but also somehow, and I think among all the science, sciences, mathematics is the simplest one. Uh, 
So we heard about uh, physics, we're very hard. <laughs> uh, medicine, it's, uh, I think it's amazing that we can know anything about such a complicated thing as human body, but mathematics, it's very simple. It's like one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, right? <laughs> and uh, I think also when it comes to mathematics, it becomes clear that mathematics, it's just everything is so simple that mathematics cannot feel our gender so for mathematics, it does not matter. Are you a boy, are you a girl, are you a man or a woman? So, and despite this, it's just the fact that even in what I know here in EPFL that we do not get enough of girls. So somehow girls, when it comes to studying mathematics, we lose girls. And I think this is very sad. And of course, this is very sad for those girls who, and women who could have uh, had a great joy in, in doing mathematics in particular or science, but they decide another occupation which might be not as exciting and as one and wonderful because studying mathematics is the most exciting job, of course. <laughs> and but I think it's also sad for mathematics and for science and for society because then we lose uh, this talent. And uh, so maybe I want to tell you, can tell you a little bit about my journey to mathematics. And uh, maybe unlike other speakers, I think my story is actually very boring. <laughs> so that I came to school and at school we have to learn how to read, how to write and how to count. And I liked counting and kind of disliked all other activities. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then, uh, I, uh, after actually, uh, at that's in Ukraine where I studied mathematics there, for the first three grades we had one teacher for all subjects, and already at the fourth year we had separate teacher in mathematics. And this uh, teacher, she was a woman, and she was super strict, and she was super cool. So I really liked her, and uh, I think all other students, they were actually a bit afraid of her. Uh, but at the same time, I think that in the depth of her heart, she was also not only super strict, but also super kind person who really cared for uh, students, and she actually was very kind to them, but in her own way of a mathematician. So. <laughs> and actually, but since then, I think my fate was decided, so... Uh, at, uh, somehow at a very early age, I, I was introduced to this uh, activity called math competitions, and I just liked it a lot. And I think I, I do. I'm a, like I'm a uh, oldest of three sisters in a family, and so I am competitive. I like to compete, and it's easy to compete when you are the oldest, right? So. <laughs> uh, and so it was something that I actually this kind of math. Com Mathematics and math competitions is what, is what I found much more interesting than a regular uh, school curriculum. And uh, 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 after finishing mid-school, I decided not to continue in the usual school, but actually to go to a school uh, which specializes in studying science. So it was a, a school for mathematics, physics, uh, chemistry, uh, yeah, and actually, actually already there I discovered that I, in our class we had 35 students and only seven of them were girls. And I think this is actually, as I know this now, this is very true that this very early age, as 12, 10, 12, 13 years old, this is maybe the first important step when we do lose a lot of somehow women talent in, in science and I think it is, it is really a pity and... Uh, and I'm also very happy that there are so many parents who came here because I think that at this stage, really, when, when children are so young, the uh, decision of parents is super important and influence of parents is super important. And uh, maybe it's also important for them to know that you know, mathematics, it's, it is for, for girls and for women and that mathematics does not know gender and uh, that I, I think it's also a fact that uh, uh, studying in, so in, in Switzerland, as I know, or as I heard, that we do, do we do not have uh, enough specialists in STEM in general, and in, part, in particular, somehow, if among we women as well, and therefore this this is a good career and good opportunity and good 
uh, future. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We are grateful to have received your questions via the Padlet for our panellists. Um, I hope you all really enjoyed your networking sessions. Um, we had a great time in here exploring uh, the biases with the, uh, the adults. So could I invite the speakers to come uh, back up to the stage? Um, just come and stand up, please. Everybody, all our, all our special guests, and let's give them a warm welcome. Okay, we have about 10 minutes where we can go through questions. And so I'm going to ask the questions that we've got here. And then um, if you'd like to answer, just step forward. Okay, so here's one that I thought was rather interesting. Um, were there any men that ever told you that you can't do something as a woman? <laughs> you all want to step forward. <laughs> Yeah, I can all the time, all the time. Uh, last time I remember there was this guy who is a CEO of a big uh, 100 fortune company and he lifted me. I was sent to him like a big feminist, he's gonna just roll the red carpet and he looked at me and said, you're too pretty, you didn't find anything else to do than that. Like what I do with Model. For him it was sort of like a waste of time because now with internet, kids can learn everything from internet, school is redundant. He's a hundred fortune uh, companies that said that to me. So this is where we are, 2023. Okay, um, next question. Um, <laughs> why are women mistreated in the first place? I know not. <laughs> because men need to use a woman to reproduce. Well, that's the stronger hypothesis we have because um, female oppression dates back to Neolithic when tribes started to settle. And it seems that contrary to what Freud said about women being frustrated not to have a penis, it's actually probably men who were frustrated not to be able to reproduce themselves and have to use another body to do that. And if you want to know who your children are, you need to make sure the other body doesn't go with other men, so you need to submit them. This is the stronger hypothesis. I'm, I'm doing it very, very short. <laughs> <laughs> How come misogyny is still tolerated today? So for anyone that's, that's younger, misogyny is like the hatred of women and the, um, the sexism. How is that still tolerated? As far as I can say that uh, it's a matter of uh, hidden biases, unaware uh, biases, people have no idea of the stereotypes. You know, when a kid, uh, 30 years ago, you know, when I was studying, if you were to ask who is a scientist, it's always a man wearing a lab coat with glasses. Uh, even today, it's impossible or near impossible for young children to imagine an astronaut can, can be a woman and many, many other professions. So there's, there's a lot of uh, bias that comes in our civilization, like you just heard, because of various reasons, historic reasons, uh, the way um, countries were uh, ruled by other countries and uh, women were easy targets, women and children were easy targets. So. Um, the tolerance of, or rather the acceptance that a woman has to tolerate is the norm rather than the exception. And on to, um, can I ask a follow-up question for what children can do um, when they want to excel within science? So within physics, for example, what, what competitions could a child take part in today? I think today, as we just heard somebody say that everything is on the net and you can find it, you know. But then, of course, you need guidance, just like knowledge is present everywhere. But you need your parents' guidance, you need your teachers' guidance, you need your mentors, you need role models. And I think the best thing that you're doing today here in this school is to to show that there are role models. I mean, I'm so happy to meet mm -hmm. role models today that, uh, that are now becoming my role models, you know, because I never liked mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> so, a great follow-up question. Well, uh, yes, on you go. Yeah, maybe like, maybe to, one thing is maybe to excel, you don't always need to compute, to 
compete. And actually in science, there are many, many great scientists who are great without competing with other and for whom actually who would uh, give, right, that for them competition was always that somehow scared them and made things unattractive to them. So maybe it's also a mindset that in order to excel, you do not really need to compute, you just need to be somehow have passion and to be good in what you do. And a follow-up question there for you, Marina, is what is it that fascinates you about studying mathematics? Yeah, so I think I already told about a little bit about this uh, uh, before, but maybe one thing I forgot, did not tell about is that mathematics is actually very creative. And this is something what we might not see while studying mathematics at school, because very often at school they are given somehow like uh, uh, no pro problems, but they also have instructions how to solve the problems, and we just should follow the instructions. And what I somehow made me interested in math competitions is maybe not the Com competitive part, but the part that there usually there is no instruction to follow. You have to make up your own instruction and it's very interesting. And uh, later, as I studied mathematics, I realized that research mathematics, it's all about that. It's about somehow finding new ways to solve problems that have not been solved before. And it means that mathematics is creative. So I don't know, mathematics, it's like Lego. It's yeah. each, each part is very, very simple. But then when you assemble them together, you can get some, uh, something really great and uh, huge and as complex as uh, nobody could, as you could not have imagined before. So this is, this is what I find fascinating about mathematics. And did, you, and did you take part in Olympiads? Is that something that you would encourage children to get involved in or teenagers to get involved in for competitions? Yes, yeah, so it was something that worked for me. It was what I, I loved as a school uh, student, but uh, then I, so I would certainly encourage children to try. At the same time, if you don't like math competitions, it still doesn't mean you don't like mathematics. I say I, I know many mathematicians, are really, really great ones, who actually don't like participating in uh, competitions and who don't like the idea of competitions. So I think it's one way to enter mathematics, but it's not the only one. And uh, yeah. um, and a question for Sivina. Um, what advice would you give aspiring medical students about studying in the UK, especially given the state of the NHS at the moment and the way junior doctors are being treated? Gosh. We're getting very political here. <laughs> um, I, I think I said this to a few people in the networking session today. I absolutely loved uh, my training um, at medical school. I absolutely loved being in the UK. I loved being in London. But it is true that the NHS is stretched and a lot of that stretch is being absorbed by junior doctors and other healthcare professionals there. I think I shared um, in one of the sessions that uh, one of the big reasons why I decided to leave the NHS was because I was attacked by a patient on a night shift um, as a result of being super understaffed. Um, and unfortunately, you don't really have the uh, you don't really have the uh, the luxury of choosing your employers uh, in the in the UK. Like either you work for the NHS or you don't. Um, and so. I think I just had a very personal, like, bad experience. And I really don't want you want that to put anybody off. But what I would say about aspiring medical students who want to study in the UK is that just because you study medicine in one place doesn't mean you're tied to that country. You know, I had this. Um, the startup idea was kind of bubbling under the surface, and so I decided to just give it a go. But the UK is a, is a very internationally recognized degree. Uh, you can travel nearly anywhere in the world. If you're interested in public health, you can work for Doctors Without Borders, you can come back to Switzerland without having to do any additional exams. So I wouldn't see that you studying in the UK as like you're committing yourself to the UK and the NHS. I think it's just an opportunity to get a really great uh, education, tough but great education, and um, it's a good founding foundation for you to be able to go anywhere. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, Andrea, could I tip pass this one to you? Um, why are we not talking yet about the salary discrimination um, between men and women in science? Yeah, very political indeed. Huh? <laughs> Uh, salaries, well, uh, this is a, uh, still on debate because if you ask ma ma many of the uh, uh, men in my uh, network, and I do, they don't see any problem, they don't think, even companies, uh, heads of companies, they think oh, we're absolutely equal until they check and they're not. But then the criteria are constantly, uh, let's say, um, 
reviewed what what does it mean and, and of course the women who took time off which we do in most of us in, in parts of our lives then they it's very easy to, to go and say well it's not comparable because you are off I don't know how many years it's whoever had kids here knows how off we are when we have kids uh, so it's very difficult now we are thinking at 80 percent difference uh, latest uh, numbers I would say that is more, but it all depends. And I don't think from, uh, that we're going to see, in, uh, at least me in my lifetime, I'm going to see any equality there. But there are many, many other fronts that we need to, to look at. Uh, then. Yeah, but salaries is one, one of them. Dr. Jamie, did you want to comment as well? No, I often say salaries are the tip of the iceberg because it's just the consequence of the difference of value that is attributed. And yes, the numbers are not so, they're high, there shouldn't be any inequality, but sometimes they're just a bit yes, but it's only this. But if you multiply the difference in salary with the number of hours women do paid work versus unpaid work, you get a difference of 36%, which is the exact difference between a, the pension a man and a woman uh, have in Switzerland. So you can see it's massive and it's, it fuels pr precariousness for everyone. So, yeah. If we talk about pensions, we, we, we will be here tomorrow morning still. <laughs> <laughs> Stefania, would you like to take that question out a bit more globally? Sure, I'll actually, comment on something that you asked. I have my daughter, and I had the same issue before, and I don't know if maybe other girls, but I don't think you need to excel. I am so humbled to be next to you guys. I mean, you knew and you are brilliant at mathematics, but I don't think you need to be the best at science to try science. I did a PhD in economics, but I'm definitely not the best in math. Um, I did not win any math competitions. I just gave it a try, and your paths are not gonna be linear. You guys are gonna have a whole, I just read an article about career portfolio. You guys are gonna have a whole career portfolio with your skills and your languages and your experience. So throw some science in there, throw some math in there, throw some tech in there, and you don't have to be the best at it. Just give it a try, because even though I'm not the best at it, it's such a useful tool for my everyday job that I use all the time, and I'm still learning. So I'm just saying, don't put that pressure, you know, that you have to be the best and have the best IB biology score to go into biology. You can, you can just go. <laughs> you can just give it a try. And I forgot my, what my question was. <laughs> I think that was a great comment, so we'll just <laughs> go on from there. Um, what do you think, um, what have been, when you reflect on your careers, and we'll maybe use this as our final question, just in light of the timing, but what has been the most rewarding and most difficult parts of your jobs? I can start. <laughs> So uh, just picking it up from uh, where uh, you left, indeed, uh, I'm also not the best physicist in town, <laughs> but um, the thing is that uh, we have to look in the long term. And uh, the competition part is taking a slightly back seat now. Collaboration is taking a front seat. So you, all of you, the younger kids, the little kid who told me that she broke her bones three times, she. Uh, uh, these are the kids who are going to solve the bigger problems. So, and we have to now imbibe the collaboration aspect more and more. Now, uh, challenge comes because fields are rapidly changing. We do not work in silos. Physics, chemistry, economics, uh, mathematics, biology, all these things have to come together for life to come together and for us to solve the sustained development goals. And uh, indeed, I think uh, that's the bigger challenge that we face. In my personal life, of course, because I changed countries, changed continents, and I think many of us have done that. So that change brought in us the fight to survive, and that was a big challenge, and I mentioned earlier, because I thought I was a really cool uh, student in India, but I came and I was on all fours on the ground when I looked at all the technology here. So just coming up to speed was the bigger challenge. And uh, speaking of rewarding moments, I think today 
just like when I interact with other children and other students, it's really a, a privilege to interact and a privilege to share whatever little we learn with the younger generation. For me, the, the, the most difficult part was when I moved to Switzerland and people were like, uh, where, where are you from? Romania? Oh, poor thing. Mm. And I, I, I really struggled so much to untape this poor thing out of me because it did stick to my skin. And like poor, uh, of course, I looked, I, well, it looks like I'm actually very poor indeed all of a sudden. Uh, so it was very difficult to, to just take this away. So I do uh, agree with what you say. Where we come from can be a beginning a bit shaky, but then it's also a strength. And we talked today about uh, a lot about jobs. But actually, nobody knows what the jobs of tomorrow will be. In five years' time, most of our, as World Economics Forum said, most of our jobs uh, are, uh, many of the jobs will, will disappear. So 30%, 32% of jobs in 2030, they don't exist yet. So why do we talk about jobs then, uh, careers? What the message I want to transmit tonight to the kids and to their parents, because we are so important in our, our children's career path, right, is that um, regardless, so as we don't know, the only thing that women, uh, uh, that the humans have, especially in that era where we, technology does so much for us, right? The only thing that we individually have is our passion, our interests, and when you do something, I think all of the ladies here can say, when you do something that you like, you love, you discover, like, well, you find at every moment the motivation to keep on going because efforts will be part of our lives or your lives at any time. But it doesn't feel like an effort when you like it, when you know why you're doing it. So that's just my, I would like to leave you with this message. Find what you feel here, that motivation that keeps you going. And a very, thank you. And a very a final question, um, do, do any of you have anything that you would like, a message that you would give to your younger self? What would that be? No, just, just maybe to also go in the same direction as Andrea, um, don't, don't limit yourself. And I think that's also what I would have talked to my younger self, but that once you've found your passion, what interests you, your emotions, don't believe the people who tell you, oh, but it's going to be difficult, it's not going to be possible. Oh, you want to do this and this? Oh, it's going to be... Just, just do it. You, you'll, you'll find out the solutions. When you do something you like, when you, you're motivated by the purpose, by the impact, then you find the solutions. So really, just aim where you want to go and, and don't limit yourself. And don't listen to those who say that it's not possible. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, could we thank our panel for a, a final time? <laughs> we have a small gift for you. For you. Um, we are so grateful for all of your presence. Um, when you go. We're so grateful for you, you coming here, for inspiring us, for educating us. Um, we've obviously come together um, as a group of of friends now, of, of colleagues um, who are all passionate about, about these topics and I hope that it's been a really useful um, evening for you. Um, you can hand the mic. Um, so here's a, a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that in a second. Um, we, we, we are very aware that it's taken a huge organisation with all of the role models from HBA and Inspiring Girls. Um, we would also like to invite you to come down um, and we have gifts for you as well. So role models, come on down. If you're still here, please come and join us on the stage. And as we're finishing with uh, the thank yous, we would be, it's been an experiment. This whole evening was uh, conceived by HBA. We brought in Model, we brought in Inspiring Girls. We'd like to know if you'd like to do it again. Um, please um, give us your feedback by capturing this QR code now and let us know what you thought. So as we give out the prizes for all the role models, if you could just, the role models come onto stage and we'll keep giving you uh, your prizes. Okay, come on to stage. And thank you to the parents for doing all yes, this, for this, bringing your children here.
Yes, we have. Thank you. Yes. I was expecting my other twin daughter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so once you have given your feedback, um, that brings us to an end. Um, let's just give a final round of applause and uh, thank you so much for coming.